Good morning. As a quick review, who's Esther? Yeah. I mean, she must be pretty important. There's a book in the Bible named after her, and she's the main character, right? <clears throat> well, she's, uh, she's the niece of Mordecai. She's the queen of Xerxes. Now, when you recognize the queen, I mean, cousin, well, <clears throat> okay. <sighs> yeah. Well, it, it's, it's the Hebrew word doesn't have the clarity that our language does. So it, it could be, and it's, and it's um, yeah. And so it's a kind of a generic word, and, and that's kind of the issue, because you have to go, well, exactly what? So, um, so to me, I say niece because that makes the most, most sense. Unless she, he's, he's just a much older cousin, and that happens. You know, like my brother-in-law, he became an uncle when he was four years old. So sometimes you have close, and sometimes you have, <clears throat> so, yeah. But, <clears throat> so, yeah. So you did bring that out, and, 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 yeah, to be honest, we can't, we can't, because the word does not mean that. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm being found out. All right. <clears throat> so last week we, <clears throat> we learned of, and, and I'm using the term nemesis, uh, Esther's nemesis, Haman. And from which ethnic people group is he descended? Okay. Ag <laughs> Agagite. And, and they've had a long-held kind of animosity and hatred toward Jews. And so, <clears throat> you know, you would think that over time, stuff like that would die, but sometimes it, it doesn't. It gets reinforced. And, and so, <clears throat> so uh, and Mordecai's actions just kind of throw gas on the fire, you know, for Haman's hatred toward the Jews. And so, um, <clears throat> now, so last week, what did we learn that Xerxes, actually Haman, but see, Haman has the signet ring, right? So as the king's right-hand man, the king's main advisor, um, if, he, if he says the, the King Xerxes says and puts his, King Xerxes says, even if he didn't or didn't want this because stuff like that could happen, right? And so he, he, want, so he, so he had this edict to go out where even though the Jews are not specifically mentioned, anybody who reads this will know that the Jews are the intended target. And then on a particular day, all of them are to be vanquished, killed, whatever, inside the empire. So that's, that sends huge shockwaves throughout the entire Jewish community because they're strewn throughout the empire. Okay? <clears throat> so um, the thing is, we're going to find out that Esther doesn't know this because she's in one of the, you know, she's part of the concubines. You think, wait a minute, she's right? But I mean, so, <clears throat> so this kind of, you know, so you have the, you have the virgin group of concubines and you have the non-virgin group. And so she's sequestered with that group even though she's the king's wife. Um, so, and so she doesn't really know anything unless somehow news gets to her. But, but you know, the women are fairly well sequestered. <clears throat> so they may not know anything, especially if the emperor says, I don't want... You know, I don't want all, the, all my women knowing these things, right? <clears throat> so she isn't aware of the edict yet, okay? So uh, she's still a bit ob oblivious. So let's start with chapter 4, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 3, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> when Mordecai learned all that had been done, that's concerning the edict to eradicate the Jews, <clears throat> Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. You know, he's supposed to be dressed according to his station which signified what his role was, not, you know, not looking all grungy and everything, which is what you would look like doing that. 
And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, so what's the general response when the news of this edict goes out? Well, they know they're targeted. And so there's, you know, there's, wow. So, and in a sense, you're kind of powerless in, in a big empire like this. So what can you do? Well, we'll rise up in rebellion. Probably not a good idea, okay? So, um, so I think if I were in that situation, I'd find a way to sneak out. You know, like I'm going to go somewhere else. But that would be a bit of, that would be a ways to go, wouldn't it? So, because, because Persia even controls Judea. So when Persia took over Babylon, right, one empire defeated the other, and, the, and so Persia said, yeah, go home and whatever, you know, uh, you're free to go home if you want, etc., etc., etc. So this edict applies to the people and the Jews in Jerusalem. Okay, so this is this is right, pretty serious. Okay, <clears throat> now earlier when you had this interchange between Mordecai and Haman, how was Mordecai acting toward Haman? See, he, there was something that he would not do, which infuriated Haman. He refused to bow down before him, which is, he should have, because based, it doesn't matter whether you like him or not, that's his position, and you want to honor that. It's not a matter of worship or idolatry, none of that. But he's like, I'm not doing that. Well, Mordecai, I'll show him, right? So it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's yeah, it's like, wow. Who knew that he would be so over the top, right? But, okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, question number three that I wrote. At this point, who is winning between Mordecai and Haman? Well, Haman is, right? Because it's, it's like Mordecai, he's not, he's not long in this world. Okay, it's pretty crazy. So you despise Mordecai and you're going to kill an entire group of people, right? But I mean... <clears throat> You know, we saw how he kind of couched things towards Xerxes and how you have this group and they're really following their own laws. And, oh, we can't have this rogue group of people doing their own thing. That's not good for the empire. So the way that he described it, it's not a crazy conclusion, even though we would go, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're talking genocide of a people, right? Whereas Xerxes is just thinking, hey, I need to maintain control of this empire and keep it running smoothly. So... <clears throat> You know, and so that's what he's thinking. Okay. So that's Mordecai's situation. And so Mordecai really can't go and do his job because he's, because he's you know, wearing the clothing and dust, you know, the ashes and everything related to uh, repentance. Okay. And next week, we'll, when we, we won't get that far today, but next week we'll find out that Esther, we would think, wow, she's a little over the top with what she's doing. But that's next week. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. Okay. <clears throat> when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, so who are these young women and eunuchs? They're her attendants. So all the concubines do have eunuchs and you know an entourage that attends to them, but Esther has her own personal, shall we say, entourage because she's the queen. Okay, so that's not weird. And... <clears throat> And usually, of course, you know, in an empire, everybody holds fealty and loyalty first to the king. But, you know, it's, it's in, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're attending the queen, it's in your best interest to make sure the queen does well, okay? Because there's so much stuff that goes on that the king's not going to know, and the queen could make your life miserable, so there's usually loyalty associated with these positions where uh, sometimes they'll even uh, perhaps go out on a limb because, well, you know, I need to support her so she supports me. And we're going to see that in a little bit, okay? So <clears throat> let, let's continue reading, okay? Um, so when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. Told her what? 
at this point, how Mordecai's dressed. She doesn't yet know why, but this is, yeah, she knows what this means, and she's distressed. Something's not right. At the same time, she's thinking, yeah, but my, I'm going to say uncle, but he needs to do his job, and he can't if he's dressed like this. Okay, so she's kind of, <clears throat> she's kind of conflicted at the moment because she doesn't really know what's at stake or at risk. All she knows is Mordecai can't do his job because he's in sackcloth and ashes. So she'll want to know, well, why, why are you repenting? Uh, what's going on? Because she doesn't know anything. She's, she's you know, cloistered in the, in the palace and, you know, unless somebody sneaks in information. And so we're going to find out that that's going to be going on. Okay? <clears throat> So the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. So what is, what is she doing? Hey, come on. You need to do your job. Okay, yeah, she's not aware of everything, but you know, yeah, repent when you're not working. That's really what she's saying, right? Um, because you can't let it consume your job, and that's not good. It's not good for me. It's not good for you. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and in a sense, Mordecai is a window to the outside world. Because he, you know, uh, over time, he's, he's, you know, he's got to know the, the eunuchs. And, and so he kind of has a little network where he could communicate, pass information back and forth, see how Esther's doing and whatnot. And so we see that here, okay? Um, so she's going to have to find out, well, why is Mordecai in, in sackcloth and ashes? You know, so as far as she knows, nothing weird's going on, right? She's just living her life as, you know, sequestered as all the concubines and the king's wife is. <clears throat> okay? So there we have it. Now let's see, we're, we're flip-flopping back and forth. Right? So we're seeing what's going on with Mordecai, what's going on inside the palace with Esther, and now, okay, well, what's Mordecai going to do? Okay, so now we're to verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Oh, well, I guess I skipped verse 5, I suppose, but unless uh, my head's in the clouds because I'm not feeling well, so maybe I read this. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, and had appointed and had been appointed to attend her and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. What's the deal with the sackcloth and ashes? Right? So she understands what's happening. She doesn't just know why. <clears throat> okay? So now what's going to happen with Mordecai? Verses six through eight. So Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. And so we would see this as bribery, but that kind of existed in, that, in their system of operating. And the amount that he promised was so outlandish that Haman had to, <clears throat> he's operating on the idea that when he ends up exterminating the Jews, he's going to collect their wealth. And he's going to give the king a huge portion of it. But what does that mean about Haman's personal wealth? He's not going to give all of it to the king. So he's going to become, right? So <clears throat> he's going to make sure that he's the second richest man in the kingdom. You don't want to be the first richest man in the kingdom more than the king. That's not good. So he's going to make sure that doesn't happen. But, um, but yeah, so... And Mordecai told him all that had happened and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay in the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Now, I'm pretty sure that Hatak, the eunuch, knows of this decree. What he doesn't know is that Mordecai is Jewish and that Esther is Jewish. Now he knows. Um, but Mordecai and Esther trust him enough because wh what did Mordecai tell Esther earlier? Right? Wow, just kind of keep it on the down low that you're Jewish. We don't want, you know, because that's bad news. So, you know, the king doesn't need to know, right? 
So, you know, in private, worship God, pray. But in public, give no clue that you're Jewish because that's, that will not bode well for you. So even though the Jews were an accepted part of the kingdom, there were still some, there were still some negative baggage. Okay, and so Haman kind of taps into that negative baggage and amplifies it. And now all the Jews, right? <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, so now, um, so now Hattak goes, oh. So he's, you know, he's supposed to relay this to Esther, right? Now, I don't know why she didn't know before, <clears throat> but, you know, if something isn't your business, what do you normally do? Usually, if something isn't your business, you go, you know, it's better off not to know, right? Because, you know, I could, I could say something and whatever, and it's bad news, right? So, <clears throat> so, you know, it's kind of, so when I was in the military and we worked on a lot of top secret stuff, okay? But if somebody else was doing something at the top secret level and it didn't apply to me, I never wanted to know. I don't care because that's not my area. And if I know something that I'm not doing, it's never good because I could inadvertently somehow say something that's, that leaks that information or whatever. So, <clears throat> but um, yeah. And so, you know, it's a, you know, you kind of work with this compartmentalized mindset. Well, this, this, is, this is what I do and this is my role. And, you know, if you, if you're too much of a busybody, it could be bad. Now, <clears throat> for Haman, okay, he's supposed to be a busybody. I mean, in the sense that he's the king's right-hand man. So he's supposed to kind of know what's going on. And then if something is very serious, he will notify the king. So that's not weird. But I'm saying, but for a eunuch, he's just like, hey, you know, this is my role, and I don't really care if, right? <clears throat> because... Um, you do not want to be called before the king <laughs> and have to explain something. That always bodes poorly. Okay? So let's look at verses 9 through 11. So now Hattak is going to relay Mordecai's information to Esther. <clears throat> and now that Hattak understands this, he might even give a little more info. We don't know. Okay? Because he, he didn't know that they were Jewish. So, right? <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> verses 9 through 11, okay? Oh, did I skip verse 8? I don't know. Yeah, 9 through 11. And Hattak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. So they're, okay, back and forth, right? Then Esther spoke to Hattak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, so there's this, right? Well, why can't she just go directly? Well, she's not allowed to. Right? So as harsh as this is to say, she was viewed as the king's property. Right? And so it was not up for her to, okay? So, <clears throat> so she has to operate within the, within the structures that exist. Okay? Otherwise she'll end up like Vashti. Right? And it's like, oh, don't want to be like that. Okay? <clears throat> so... Um, so anyways, Esther spoke to Hattak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, are we beginning to notice a shift now? Starts out, Esther's completely passive, right? These things happen to her and she's just along for the ride. Then she begins to become active, right? Doing stuff, but now she goes from being active to commanding, see? So she realizes something is really serious and she's in a position to do stuff that nobody else can, at least as a Jewish person. And so she's stepping up to the plate, you know, which is wow. But, you know, we learned a little bit about Esther before, right? Just the <clears throat> everyone's impressed with her. And so we could just say, well, she probably has some type of charisma, not just simply beautiful, but she has this aura where people want to be around her. Um, and so she, she, has, she has a lot more influence than simply, even as queen, okay? Queen has a lot of influence, but it's more, 
you know, behind the scenes. Because the queen doesn't really rule. The queen doesn't really make edicts. But she could be very powerful on how she can influence the king. Okay. So <clears throat> now, so we see this word commanded him. So, so now we see this, this shift in Esther. You know, so she's, um, right, she understands her vocation. We'll get into that in, in a moment, okay? So she, you know, so <clears throat> commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. So it's like, well, I just can't go in uninvited to the king unless something freaky happens, I'm dead. And then what good am I, right? I'll be a dead Jewess. And then I won't be able to influence anything because I'm dead, right? So you can kind of understand that. She, she, she may not know what's going on outside the court, but she understands the court workings. And she goes, this is, you know, I'm betting the entire farm if I did this. And more than likely, Okay. And, and why is that the case? Because if you're the king, everybody wants to kill you <laughs> because you have the power and, you know, somebody else wants it. Okay. <clears throat> so that, that's not weird when you look throughout antiquity. Most kings, wow. It's better to be a pauper than a king if it comes to staying alive. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so she says, yeah, if I go there without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come in, into the king for these 30 days. So what is the king being doing? Sleeping with other women. Because he has two huge concubines, right? <clears throat> so... And she's saying, well, it'd be different if the king was calling me in all the time and there was this, you know, this kind of understood sort of thing. But he hasn't called me in over a month. And if I just show up, right? That's bad news. So even though Mordecai is saying, hey, what is she saying back? Are you crazy? Yeah. You know, there's a 90% chance I'm going to be killed. And that's not going to help anybody. Let's figure out plan B. <clears throat> okay, so, <coughs> <coughs> and that's not weird, is it? Right? <clears throat> so, um, so Mordecai is going to respond to her, and what he says is quite insightful. So, let's look at verses 12 through 14, okay? So, and they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. So, see this back and forth? It's like a tennis game, right? You know, again, the, getting the back and forth head thing going on. Um, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. This edict is universal. Do you think you're somehow going to? If, you know, and if the king hasn't seen you in a month, he'll go, well, I want to see the queen. Oh, well, uh, she's dead. What? Well, she was Jewish and your edict. <laughs> Okay, find another wife, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so he would, he would be angry, but it, it could very well happen because he doesn't know all the everyday workings and stuff. He's the emperor. He's not micromanaging everything. So it's very important that whoever works beneath you knows your thinking and does stuff you would want to do in a situation because you don't go, oh, well, king, what do you? No. That's why I pay you and hire you. I don't, you know, you know my thinking and take care of it. Okay? <clears throat> so it could happen. It's not as if Mordecai is just blowing hot air here. <clears throat> okay? And then, uh, so let's, let's continue on a bit, all right? Um, for if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Now, another place most likely is referring to some other agency God will use to save his people. Mordecai doesn't know who this will be or what this will be. Okay, so he has faith that God somehow will save his people, the chosen people through whom the Messiah is promised. Okay, but he can't state how, 
And so he, he's kind of vague from another place. Okay? But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Wow. Right there. Why are, you, why are you in the position? Well, it's because you can look at all of these things, right, that happened. And you would have to say, yeah, but even, even all of these things, which were the what? Actions of people, sometimes sinful, God is still working His will. Okay? And now Esther is in a position where she could make a difference. Okay? <clears throat> so, uh, let's, let's look on page two. Okay. And we talked about going to the king, etc., etc. So, <clears throat> in order to see the king, she's supposed to meet with Haman first. Because Haman is the guy who's kind of the filter. Well, what are you going to say? Just make something up? Or, <clears throat> you know, so, you know, the edict came from Haman. So, <clears throat> she really can't go through Haman. Because Haman most likely will say, No. And then, well, if you're told no, then that's really bad if you still approach the king after being told no. It's better to approach not being told no, right? What's the adage? It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Isn't, uh, sometimes people say that. Um, and in this case, that happens to be true because she's thinking, well, if I approach Haman, uh, he'll tell me no, and then, you know, then my hands are tied even more. <clears throat> so they'll be tied in, in the sense that, well, you can't approach the king without permission, and I didn't receive permission. Whereas if she approaches the king without permission, that's it. See, she's not violating two things, she's violating one. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so this is Mordecai's reasoning with Esther in the middle of page two. You will not survive Haman's purge. Implication. So if you're going to die anyway, right, you might as well risk death to do what is right. Okay. It's like, well, I have nothing to lose. I'm Jewish and I'm going to get purged. So, so might as well do something. And if it ends up in being my death, well, I died a little earlier than I would have. Okay. If you do nothing, God will still act to save his people. That's Mordecai acting on faith, believing this to be so. Okay. And <clears throat> so we'll we'll get some insight when, when the Septuagint, we'll see the Septuagint, the Greek language Old Testament, records the, some of the prayers that he and Esther prayed. So they're, they're insightful, okay? So Mordecai warns there is no escape by inaction. Her true purpose may be that God has chosen her for this special mission. And of course, what? What, 2,500 years later we would go, yes, God has. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, and so when Mordecai says, well, who knows? Well, you know, it's not just as blasé as English. So if you're on page two, we can kind of see how it's used elsewhere within Jewish culture. Uh, and what does, what does that mean? So who knows contains, contains the expectation that God very well may act. So go ahead and do it. Okay, and so we see that in Samuel 12. When King David's son was dying, he said, while the child was alive, I feared and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let me live. Okay, or let him live. And then Joel 2.14, and that's when, uh, <clears throat> you know, Joel is calling the nation to repent. So uh, when he called Israel to repent, he said, who knows? God may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. So you can even offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. Do what's right, okay? And then from Jonah, when Jonah called the people of Nineveh to repent, he said, who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Of course, if you read Jonah, Jonah really did not want to go. It was like God kind of forced him, right? <clears throat> these, are, these are our enemies, God. Come on. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> and he defies God <laughs> And God still ends up sending him to where he needed to be. <clears throat> okay? So page three, a little excursus on vocation. Okay? Now the idea of vocation 
is that as God's people, God gives us things to do. Okay? And these are based on what? Where we are, our skills and abilities, or they may be official positions into which we're placed. Okay? So one of my vocations is that of a pastor. Okay? <coughs> so, um, so being a pastor isn't simply that, oh, well, one has the ability or can do this. It's a position that one is placed into. Okay, uh, husband and wife, right? Those are vocations in which one serves the other. And so these are God's normal ways of working, right? So uh, what's that hymn that says God, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform? Yeah, he does. But most of the time he doesn't. Well, that's a boring hymn then. But most of the time God works through people. And you think, what? we can just look to Jesus. Jesus became human. Worked through a person, though he was also God, right? And so right there, that's the paradigm. What is God's normal way of work? So God took on a form where we could look upon him and not die, right? And so that's kind of the hiddenness of God. And, and so and Jesus did a lot of stuff that's mysterious. Every Sunday when we celebrate the sacrament, yeah, that's one of Jesus' mysterious wonders to perform. But how does he do that? Through a person. Okay? So, <clears throat> so all of you are, you, all of you interface in this world. And you have different skills and abilities. And God brings people into your life. And who is your neighbor? And all that sort of thing. And in these places you serve. You're God's agent, maybe secret agent, in the sense that <coughs> you're doing stuff and nobody, people around you may not know that what? You're actually the hand of God. I mean, I don't want you guys to get arrogant, but that's how that works. See, that's how God works his will. Most of the time through people. Yeah, but you know, you know how messed up people are and we're going to get it wrong and, yep. We will. Not that we want to get things wrong, right? But the thing is, is that we, don't, we should not live life scared into an action because we might do the wrong thing, right? We recognize that we're saved, that we're forgiven in Christ, and so we live our life realizing that. Not choosing to sin, but if we mess up, whew, good. Oh, I'm glad I'm forgiven because, wow, man. That really bombed, okay? So Esther recognizes her vocation as queen. Okay? She's in a position that no one else has who is Jewish. If not her, who? And Mordecai speaking in faith, well, God will do something, right? But you're here, you're in that position, you're in this place, are you really going to think that God wasn't working behind the scenes, making sure that you are here to what? Ensure his people survive. Okay? And <clears throat> whenever we doubt that this could actually happen, all we have to do is look to the life of Christ. Every single person along the road to Jesus' crucifixion acted out of his or her, well, in this case, it would all be his, their self-interests. You know, the Roman rulers. Pilate didn't want to crucify Jesus. But he said, you know, it's going to be bad news if I don't. Because I need to try to keep, I need to keep peace in this boiling tea kettle. And, you know, of course, he, the Jewish leadership really gave him a bad reading of the people's sentiment. He thought, oh, man, all the people in Jerusalem want him dead. You know, he didn't know that, you know, the, the chief priests in the Sanhedrin kind of hand-picked a crowd you know, to yell, crucify him, no matter what he did, right? So he didn't know that. But, but at the end of the day, he, he's acting out of his self-interest. The Jewish leaders do. It's better for one man to die than the whole nation suffer. So everyone's doing all this stuff, and yet God worked through all of that sinfulness, and our salvation resulted. So that right there, when you go, oh, I don't see how, just look to Christ. Okay? All right. So, well, 
See this back and forth, this tennis volley game that's happening. So let's, let's look at uh, verses 15 through 17. Okay. <clears throat> okay. My head's kind of swimming, so if you ask a question that's too hard, I'll just might, I just might blink out or something. <clears throat> okay. Uh, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. <clears throat> Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, so that's the capital city, okay? <clears throat> and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my young women will also fast as you do. So in other words, okay, I'm going to fast before I do this, okay? Um, I'm going to approach this in repentance. And she's asking the other Jews to participate. So through this, there, there is this collective repentance. There's, co there's this collective praying, see? And so we might go, well, what do you mean? This is all like staged and it's planned and, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, in our, in our conversations, or our discourses with God, we have impromptu, unplanned stuff. We have hymns. We have written stuff. And it's all part of our conversations with God. And so this isn't phony or staged. This is, you know, the people are all participating. This is their way to collectively repent, but also to support Esther. Esther, we're here for you. Okay? So <clears throat> we, we, we have to, you know, it's the somehow we inherited this weird mindset. Well, you know, if it doesn't come straight for the heart, it's not real. Like, well, where'd you get that from? Right? I mean, that's not in Scripture. What about all the times when, when the Jewish people prayed the Psalms? Oh, well, those weren't real because it was... So anyway, just kind of, <clears throat> you know, so that's what I like about Lutheranism because we have the full panoply of prayer from impromptu to all I can do is groan before God because it's so messed up to what? The, the most beautiful poetry in our hymns. You know, so we have this full range. And I love it because... These are all expressions of not only what we want to say, but what we often should say. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's continue on, and I don't know where I was at. Uh, la, 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 la. <clears throat> 18 was you? Oh, there is no verse 18. Okay, 17. Okay, right. <clears throat> Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So, you know, even though earlier Esther said, okay, I'm going to do everything my uncle, my dad tells me, um, now the tables have turned, okay? Because she's in a position to do something, and so she's in the know. So she need, we need to be following her lead. Okay, so and 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 you know it's it's quite interesting when you kind of see the character of who Esther is. She she's not <clears throat> she's not shall we say rash because she first said hey you know I'm probably going to get killed and what good is a dead queen and yet when she realizes oh okay so she's not afraid to step up to the plate but she's smart in how she does this. And she's not bossy, but when she needs to be, she is. So you can see this, you can see the character range of who she is. And so she's just a, a wonderful woman of God. And, um, and I, I just, wow. How could, how could someone not delight in the story of Esther? So let's, um, <clears throat> let's read a little bit. So <clears throat> I wrote kind of Esther rises to the occasion. That's just what I told you, right? That, you know, she, she steps up to the plate and now she's in a sense giving orders, okay? Which is a little out of whack, but that's not weird. She's the queen, okay? And, um, and normally it would be like, well, you know, I'm not going to order my dad around, which is the equivalent of who Mordecai was. But the situation is, is that she's there and, right? And so <clears throat> it's appropriate that she that she does, okay? So, next section, to the king. Now we're gonna jump to the Septuagint, because the Septuagint records the prayers, 
Okay? So we're going we're gonna to look at Mordecai's prayers. Next week, we'll, we'll jump into Esther's prayers. Okay? And so, of, of course, in the Septuagint, there's a lot of mention of God. Okay? Not in the Hebrew text. But we can find in the Septuagint, right? This is not a translation. These are additions. Okay? But somehow, the writers to this, somebody recorded this, and it ended up in, in the Greek Greek text, okay? So when Mordecai most of the time speaks about God, he uses theos, the Greek word for God, or Basileus, king. Though we'll see that, uh, that he also, king can go either way, okay? Uh, but when he's speaking to God, meaning praying, he uses kyrios, okay? Which is what? Well, that's the word for Lord. But when you look at the Old Testament translation, when you see the word Yahweh, that's translated as kurios in the Septuagint. Okay? So that's the intimate name of God. Okay? So <clears throat> we can kind of see how the Greek language kind of follows that. Okay? So <clears throat> if we go back to um, when Moses when God appears before Moses in the burning bush, what does he say? Well, uh, you know, I go to Pharaoh and I show up and he's going to go, who are you, Yehu? Right? I have to say, who sent, who sent me? Because if I say, well, hey, I'm just coming on my own, he'll be, be gone. And, right? And he's dead the next minute. <clears throat> so he says, well, tell them that I am sent you. Okay. Um, now, in the Greek, it's more of a statement of continuing existence than it is in the Hebrew, but that's because the Greek language could do things that the Hebrew can't, okay? So, I am, and Yahweh is a form of he is. So, what do we call, well, we, the closest thing we could just say is he is. He has always been. He always will be. I mean, that's kind of the, you know, so that's the third person. The first person is I am. Third person, he is. So, <clears throat> it's, so Yahweh is a form of he is. Okay? So that's just, so we could kind of know, because we can kind of see even so, um, the, uh, the, the language norms are, are really, they're coming through in the, in the Greek text. Okay? Which would mean that Mordecai did not pray originally in Greek. Okay? So, probably not in Hebrew, but maybe, because, you know, at this time, the Jews are losing their ability to think and speak and read in Hebrew. Okay? So, Mordecai then beseeched the Lord, remembering all the works of the Lord, and said, O oh Lord, Lord, Almighty King. Catch that, Lord, Lord? Though here it's Kyrios, Kyrios, whereas uh, in the Old Testament, when you see that, see, they're, they're putting in an extra name for God because you don't want to have to say Yahweh. Oh, we, we don't want to say Yahweh because, because it, we could be using his name incorrectly. So we'll just say another word. And so when you see that, that's really what happened. So the scribes put God so that way when somebody's reading it, they don't have to say Yahweh. So that's, yeah. So, O oh Lord, Lord Almighty King, all things are under your power and there is no one to oppose you in your desire to save Israel. He's buttering God up. Or we can say he's simply stating who God is. He's holding God up. You promised. You promised a Messiah through this people you set apart going back to Abraham. Are you going to fail us? So this is really just a way of restating the promise that God had said. Even though it's like, yeah, it does look like he's buttering, buttering up God. For you have made heaven and the earth and every wondrous thing under heaven. And you are the Lord of all, and there is no one who shall resist you, Lord. Okay? So, what is Mordecai saying? He's recognizing who God is and how he is all-powerful. And if God wants to make sure that he saves his people, he'll do that somehow. Mordecai doesn't know how, but he knows God can. And so, he's saying, this is who you are, be true to your promise, and... Okay, so we can kind of see where he's, he's going with this. In other words, <clears throat> he has a strong faith. He's, he believes in God, not only the creator, 
But right? You promised, you know, there's going to be the sin slayer from the people you set apart. How is that going to happen if we're all dead? Because remember, who's part of the Persian Empire now? Even the Jews living in Judea, Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> you know, oh, I'm sure there'd be a few survivors, but it would not bode well. Okay? So, um, <coughs> so he's really, <clears throat> in a sense, he's holding God accountable to his promises. And he's stating who God says who he is. Can we go wrong? Just repeating back to God who he tells us he is? No. Right? It's okay. So let's continue on. Okay. Um, you know all things. You know, O Lord, that it is not out of disrespect or arrogance or love of honor that I did this, to refuse to bow down to the haughty Haman. It was still stupid. Okay. So... <clears throat> for I would have been happy to kiss the soles of his feet for the salvation of Israel. Now he says this, right? Now that everyone's life is at risk, but at the time, pfft, I'll bow to everybody but you. Really? Because if he refused to bow before all the court officials, he would not be working for the king. He, pfft, he'd be gone. You cannot have somebody that disrespectful because to be that disrespectful is to be disrespectful to the king because the people under him work there because he places them there or, you know, all the institutions that he has places them there. So every time you do something like that, it, you're really disrespecting the king. It all kind of eventually goes to him. And so... Uh, so Mordecai was able to get away with Haman, but if it was all the others, he would not be, he would not, he wouldn't be around. He would be banished or something, okay? Um, for I did this in order that I not place the glory of man above the glory of God. Okay, I think it's getting a little deep here, Mordecai. I mean, this is just my take on it. This is what he prayed, but I'm like, really? Really? You know? I think you should kind of repent. This is me, right? <clears throat> but it kind of tells us who our God is, right? That he's even going to grant mercy when it's kind of a lily-livered, half-excuse repentance. Wow. But think about that. Can any of us really repent enough to earn God's favor? No, no. So we repent because that's part of our life of faith. But our repenting is not a work that we do which will what? Flip God around. And you look at this and you go, oh man, you know, I think he should send Mordecai to the woodshed. I mean, come on. There's a little bit of BS in here. Am I wrong in my thinking here? And I think if we were listening to this through the Septuagint, we would all go, Oh boy, okay Mordecai, I mean, I get it, but wow, it's never a good thing to kind of lie to God, or shall we say, half-truths, okay? I will not bow down to anyone but you, my Lord, and I will not do those things out of arrogance. Well, hey, he's been bowing down to all the other court officials, so why would Haman be an act of worship? See, it doesn't make sense, okay? But... Maybe that's where, where his mind was. You know, this guy's so arrogant and he wants me to think he's God. I'm not bowing down to him. So there could be that element in there. See, so I'm looking and I'm thinking, well, I don't know, this sounds a little thick here. But okay, but these are the words he prayed and God is a God of mercy. And we go, oh, wow, good. Okay. So, and the question I wrote on the bottom of page four, in what way is Mordecai not being entirely truthful? Well, right? I mean, there was some personal animosity, and I'm not gonna, even if this was part of his thinking, okay? So, um, all right. So, <clears throat> and so here's on page five, yet Mordecai prayed having faith in the Messiah to come. In other words, he's saying, right, you're all powerful, and you can save your people. He's holding God up to the promise. He has faith in the Messiah to come, okay? And so, in 
before Jesus came, we would say, well, that's the equivalent of praying in Jesus' name, even though you won't know his name. You're, you're praying in the promise that God has made, which is his messianic promise, right? So he's approaching God based on that. That's the same thing as praying in Jesus' name, just without those exact words, okay? <clears throat> so would God hear his prayer? Yes, because it's a prayer of faith. So think about the times when we pray. Do, some, do we sometimes pray for stuff we shouldn't? Yeah, we're messed up, just like you, right? And so we could pray for something that's really bad, that's, that's not God's will. But if we're praying in Jesus' name, oh, yes, yes. As Joyce says, not my will, but so praying in Jesus' name is really saying, you know, if this is not your will, change it. And so, you know, you're saying, oh man, I don't like my neighbor. God, make his toilet overflow. <laughs> or, you know, it would be like, uh, what, what should the prayer be? May his toilet flush well, <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> but yeah, so, you know, that's part of faith. We realize that we're going to mess stuff up. And so we want Christ's intercession to make right what may be wrong. Yeah, I mean, we're totally arrogant if we think, right? That, that we can only pray good stuff, right? We're saints and sinners. Okay? Let's, let's, um, let's look at this last little part of, of Mordecai's prayer. And now, O Lord God, King, God of Abraham, save your people, right? Going back to the original promise. Through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. But I'm an old man. And I need Viagra, and it doesn't yet exist. And my wife, well, pfft, she's gone through menopause a long time ago. She's a dried up husk. That's the stuff. I mean, it's hilarious when you read the Hebrew. You're like, there's no, Abraham's like, there's no way this is happening. God, come on. I mean, yeah, you're God, but come on. You can't bring life out of death, and yet he can, right? I mean, it's just, oh, we clean up the Hebrew text way too much. <laughs> when, wow. Okay, anyway, so save your people, for they, look, for they look upon us for our destruction, and they desire to destroy your inheritance from the beginning, right? I'm reminding you of your promise. You don't need reminding, but I'm doing that anyway. Do not disregard your portion which you redeemed for yourself out of the land of Egypt. Hear my prayer and be merciful to your inheritance. Turn our mourning into feasting so we may live and hymn your name, O Lord. Do not destroy the mouth of those who praise you. Wow. This is just beautiful. Because he's asking for this, but it's just, but it's based on who God is and what he has promised. So, okay. Then all Israel cried out with all their might, for their death was before their eyes. So, it's, uh, uh, it makes me wonder if there are some parts like, why did you bring us to the Persian Empire? So you can let us all die? <laughs> that would be, if you remember like Israel when they're in the wilderness, right? <clears throat> so, I wonder if any of that was going on. Who's to say? If so, it's not recorded. <clears throat> so, so, all the people... All the Jews are praying to God for deliverance. They're all part of this collective repentance, collective, um, you know, their collective prayers rising to God. And so next week we'll look at, well, what does Esther pray? And so she likewise will put on sackcloth and ashes and dirt or something else. Okay? Thoughts, questions? <clears throat> okay. I just love the book of Esther. It's, wow. How could anybody not fall in love with her? <laughs> but maybe I'm weird. So, yes, yes. And, and she's a very, very strong woman who was content to operate with how she should, yet she doesn't do anything out of cowardice. I mean, wow. I, I, only, I only say, well, I hope, I hope I could always be so strong. You know, so are we good next week? We'll start with the prayers of Mordecai and then we'll I think we'll probably delve into chapter five. Of course, 
you know, Esther's prayers are long. There's a lot going on there. So we'll see how that goes. Okay? Let us pray. Our Father, what a delight it is to learn about your, your saints in the Old Testament, especially Esther. How she operated in a world that was totally contrary to her faith. Where in a sense she was forced to do things that she shouldn't have. And yet, she, you still work through all of those things to ensure your people survived through whom the Messiah came. May we always delight in her story and how she operated within her world as she best could with the faith she had. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.